So inside Lewin Davis, um, there's a story that the Coen brothers um, had, came up with the idea for inside Lewin Davis from a single idea. You know, what if Dave Van Ronk was beaten up outside Gerd's Folk City in 1961? Explain who him. Well, Dave is. Van Ronk is a sort of Greenwich Village uh, character, somebody who I mean, actually, but there's all this talk about you know not somebody who is famous, but actually somebody who you know who, who is sort of fairly legendary. So what we have is we have the character played by. Uh, uh, Oscar Isaac, who is uh, Lewin Davis. At the beginning of the film, we see him playing a song in its entirety. He sings Hang Me, Oh, Hang Me. And he did, it's, it's, uh, the performances are done live, which I think pays huge dividends. And so you get the sense that he is you know, some kind of impressive character. He then goes and gets himself beaten up in the alleyway outside the club. What then happens over the rest of the deliberately sort of meandering and um, elliptical narrative is that he sort of goes from one uh, unsuccessful situation to another. Essentially, he used to be part of a, of a singing duo. The singing duo is now finished since his partner has thrown himself off a bridge, not just off a bridge, but off the wrong bridge. He is effectively homeless. He is sleeping on people's couches. Everybody tells him that he's a terrible person, whether it's uh, Kerry Mulligan, who is this fellow folk singer, Gene, who... Uh, who, who he may have an ongoing personal problem with. Um, the managers of the folk clubs that he visits who say, that, well, I don't see any money in what you're doing. And he basically wanders from one situation to another with this sense of somebody who is to some extent carrying the weight of the world on him. And he has this dream that what he's going to do, he'll, you know, he might get to Chicago and things will start to look better. At the very beginning of the film, he lets a cat out of uh, an apartment that he's crashing in. And the cat then whose name we won't reveal because it's kind of plot spoiler, the cat then crisscrosses his path, or maybe it's a different cat. There is a cat that looks, it looks like the same cat, but maybe it's not the same cat, and it crisscrosses his path during the course of the narrative. And then we end up in very, very sort of Coen Brothers uh, fashion with events spiralling back on themselves. This is not a plot spoiler, incidentally. It's saying that the, the narrative is elliptical is perfectly fine. So there are a number of things that are really good about the film. The first one is Oscar Isaac's performance, and he's terrific. I mean, he's a, he's really good. He's really good at playing this kind of... He looks... It's not so much world-weary. It's somebody who's out, a man out of time, to use that Elvis Costello phrase. It's like around him, the world is starting to change. Bob Dylan is just about to happen. Everything is about to kind of kick off, and suddenly this scene is about to become... And he's sort of missed the boat already. And he's very good at doing that. And incidentally, in terms of the, the, the uh, question that we were having before about whether or not a, ca a central character has to be sympathetic for you to care about them, it's a perfect example of a, of a character who doesn't deserve your sympathy because in many ways he's a completely rubbish person. But on the other hand, you do end up caring about him. Partly, it has to be said, because everyone keeps telling him how rubbish he is and so you sort of start to feel sorry for him. But actually, it's, it's more than that. It's because the way in which he plays this sort of wastrel figure is, is engaging. The look of the film is beautiful. It obviously takes as its um, as its central uh, uh, colour palette the cover, for example, of the freewheel in Bob Dylan. It's that sort of muted browns and greens. Everything is cold. Everything is snowy. Everything is freezing. And all the time, there's this sort of sense of you know you're huddling from a from a hostile atmosphere. And there are things in the film that are very funny. Not least this clip, which we're going to play you now, which is a clip when because he's so in need of money, he ends up playing on a, a playing session guitar on a song which is a, a sort of, it's, it's an anti, it's a sort of space race novelty song which he thinks sounds absolutely terrible and on which he decides to take a session fee rather than a royalty. Here is Please Mr. Kennedy. Please Mr. Kennedy, take one and we're rolling. Second, please. Please, Mr. Kennedy. Uh -oh. I don't want to go. Don't you show me in the out of school. Oh, please. please, Mr. Kennedy. Uh -oh. I don't want to go. Don't you show me in the out of school. I sweat when they stuff me in the pressure suits. Bubble helmet, dashboard, and boots. Nowhere of there Outer. in gravity space. Suits. I need to be, don't need to be a space. Reading me loud and clear, oh, please, Mr. Kennedy. Uh -oh. I don't want to go. Please don't show me out of space. Oh, please, Mr. Kennedy. Uh -oh. I don't want to oh, go. Please don't show me out of space. space. I'm six foot two, so perhaps you'll tell me how I fit into a five foot capsule. I won't be known as one of the century. You 
Track on the soundtrack that you'll skip unless you're with your five-year-old who'll like it very much. Okay, well, all I can say is if that doesn't make you want to go and see the film, then nothing will. And there is, as I said, there is so much to like and there is so much going on. Here is the problem for me. Now, I know that many people love this. I've seen many people giving it five-star reviews. I've seen many people saying it's their favourite film of the year. There, there is um, a temptation to compare it to Oh Brother Where Art Thou because obviously the musical thread sees that but in fact the, the closest comparison is to A Serious Man the sort of the, the Job-like thing the tested man the you know indignity and woe. how much worse can exactly it get? how much worse can it get and also the sense of why 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 the difference being of course that in the case of a serious man he does actually rail where in in this case what happens with Lewin Davis is he just sort of wanders and just sort of meanders and just sort of wombles and doesn't you know in a way he's not even angry most of the time unless it's actually when a nerve is touched which is to do with his old writing partnership what he is is sort of detached sort of removed now my problem is that whilst I admire it greatly, and I do, I think it looks really good. I think the attention to detail in terms of the music is extraordinary. I think the way in which the, you know, the colour palette, I think all those things are great. I watched it the first time, and I it played to me like um, like a song that has a verse that feels like it's about to get to a chorus and never quite does. And I thought, you know, having noticed all these things and, you know, I like that and I, the, the, the cat narrative is very important. I mean, it's, it might be possible to kind of you say, well, the cat is... So actually, the cat is almost the most important thing because the cat gets let out of the bag at the beginning and the cat keeps crossing his path. And then there's a central moment when he stands outside a cinema and the cinema is showing The Incredible Journey, which, of course, is the story of domestic cats travelling hundreds of miles to get back home. And there's the question all the way through about, is it the same cat? Is that the cat? Or is that a different cat? Did he run the cat over? What is... And there's a sort of sense within that cat thing that there's the key to the movie is in there somewhere. And having got to the end of it the first time, I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'm, I admire that, but I'm not sure that I really like it. I'll have to go back and try it a second time. And I did. And the second time round, I felt exactly the same way about it. I felt that it was a film that, whilst it is clearly made with passion in terms of the attention to detail, it's not, I have to say, a film which gripped me and got me on a gut level. And what bothers me about it is, as somebody who really likes the Coen Brothers films, as somebody who really likes the fact that they did the music live, as somebody who, you know, interested enough in that in, in that folk scene that it's, that it's describing, I'm looking at it thinking, why don't I like it more? And I think the answer is that it feels too arch. It feels too whimsically self-contained. I mean, the Coens have this thing, this repetitive thing that they do of not, you know, not, if you ever ask the Coens what a movie is about, they'll deliberately give you, a, you know, an obfuscating answer, which is fine because they don't like saying this is about this. But the film itself seems to withhold so much. It seems to be so in with, there is an element of the film that it's kind of like Lewin Davis himself, that it's very, very sort of insular and very, very self-contained. And I'd be lying if I told you that I loved it because I don't. I admire it and I admire it very much and I would urge people to see it because there is so much to admire and because I know so many people who like it. But it didn't move me. 